unplugged in, social media is supposed to bring us closer together. But it can also be used to spread disinformation, driving us further apart. They've got rules, but they don't enforce them all terrifically. You know, they, they sometimes enforce them, they sometimes don't. Governments around the world are considering new regulations on big technology. Although I do think that there are, of course, some reasonable restrictions to be put in place, I think that denying people access to these platforms really does great harm. Is there enough oversight? Are civil liberties being violated? Is your privacy protected? Next Unplugged In, social media, who decides? Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington, D.C. In 2020, more than three and a half billion people use some form of social media. And by 2025, use is expected to grow to nearly four and a half billion. Social media is connecting people in ways never imagined. And it is being used to distribute news and information relying on shared connections for circulation and validation. Social media companies are coming under increasing pressure from users and governments to moderate the content that crosses their platforms. The pressure includes checking for facts and inflammatory speech. VOA technology correspondent Michelle Quinn examines the debate here in the U.S. over social media's gatekeeping role. In the wake of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, there is renewed interest in looking at the power of technology giants. Protesters reportedly use social media to plan. Facebook and Twitter kicked off their sites. Former President Donald Trump and others, Google, Apple, and Amazon, booted Parler, an app used by supporters of Trump. The real source of power is, is being a gatekeeper, um, being, being an intermediary that everyone has to pass through. That's really the thing that we want to look at. Scrutinizing so-called big tech is nothing new. Google, Facebook, and Amazon are already facing antitrust investigations, and tech CEOs routinely testify in Congress. While many agree that tech has too much power, they differ on what to do about it. Break up the companies, restrict their abilities to collect user data, and allow users to sue if their privacy is violated, put laws in place to make the firms responsible if they are conduits for online falsehoods. The Republicans are upset at what they see is cancel culture or companies moderating conservative speech on their platforms. And Democrats tend to be more concerned that platforms aren't moderating enough and are leaving up too much hate speech or too much um, harassment. When it comes to online misinformation, something both parties say is a problem, creating new rules can be difficult, particularly in the U.S., where the First Amendment protects speech. How do you write a piece of legislation that makes illegal misinformation but protects satire and parody and comedy and commentary and hyperbole and like all of these other things that we use for entertainment and that are important parts of political discussion and discourse. What's needed, say some observers, is a fresh look at big tech's power, including how the technology itself works in uniting or dividing people. I think a national conversation on this, what are the rules of the road? What's the appropriate conduct? How do we keep people safe? And I think that is really a, a turning point. Over coming months, more users and governments worldwide will debate tech's role as powerful gatekeepers for society. Michelle Quinn, VOA News. The U.S. Congress has begun a series of hearings about the spread of misinformation and also about competition in the digital economy. Kara Swisher is an opinion writer for The New York Times and also host of The New York Times podcast, Sway. She is a noted authority on big tech and the rise of social media. I asked her about the evolution of social media and the issues of freedom of speech and content moderation. Okay, Kara, how long have you been reporting on the internet and social media? Oh, social media came a little later, but the internet since the early 1990s, so 30 years. And what, what got your attention into social media when it came along? 
Well, I think, you know, it was just every every bit of technology has a different iteration every time something changes. And social media was sort of the natural extension from everybody getting on the Internet. Um, and so what caught my attention was the ability to actually talk and reach out to people in a much more significant way. Now, this had happened early in the Internet with AOL, if you remember their chat rooms and different things. So it's not a new, fresh idea that social media isn't. Um, but it certainly it took a took a huge leap forward when there used to be. There, there were companies like Friendster and then Facebook and many others. And then it just moved into a much more uh, integral part of people's lives, like a utility almost. So what's, what are the big ones? Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram and YouTube. Are those sort of the big ones? Yeah. They, well, YouTube is a, is a video network, but it's a social network in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, there's Reddit, there's Snapchat. They're all different sort of t TikTok. They all take it from a different angle. Uh, Snapchat's more communications, TikTok's more media. Facebook is more community, good and bad. Um, Twitter is more instant news observation. Reddit is much deeper discussion. So they all take a different, uh, different slice of the pie, essentially. In looking at Twitter and Facebook, are they more like news organizations that publish or are they like phone, con phone company and sort of connecting people? Well, it's, that's the problem. We don't quite know what they are. They they're call themselves platagers, if you, if you want to have a weird, horrible English word, uh, which is a publisher and a platform. They tend to say platform when they don't want to take responsibility for things. They never say publisher because they don't want to take responsibility for the media that's on their platform. But in fact, they're kind of a new kind of media company, in my estimation. So do they have responsibility for the content that's on their platform? Well, no, they don't because of a thing called Section 230, which was passed a long time ago, also in the 1990s, um, which protects them and gives them broad immunity for third party stuff that's published on their platform. So, no, they right now do not have liability, except in certain cases uh, having to do with sex trafficking and, and uh, pedophilia and things like that. When you talk about Section 230, that's a U.S. law. Does that, if you know, does that impact um, uh, whether or not they're vulnerable to lawsuits or responsibility for content around the world? No, it does not. They're not protected from a lot of things around the world. You know, there's not the First Amendment doesn't exist around the world. So in Germany, they have to behave quite differently than they do here right around Nazi symbolism, things like that. They have to take it down pretty quickly. So they act much more like a, a publisher than anything else in those places. What's the impact of Twitter and Facebook, those are the main ones I'm talking about, on, on, on international politics, on domestic politics, meaning U.S. politics? Mm -hmm. Huge. I mean, Twitter's been the way Donald Trump had been uh, communicating. Almost he campaigned on it. He made political decrees. He attacked enemies. That was his mode of, of communication with most of his followers and most reporters, everybody else. Um, you know, Facebook is more a place where people gather and they did a, like, for example, the Trump administration used it for a lot of like the campaign used it for a lot of political advertising and political targeting of content and things like that. Abroad, it's used in a variety of ways by a variety of people. Sometimes, you know, they use it to abuse people. Sometimes they use it to create uh, campaigns and, and different things. It just depends on the country. Well, if you look at like Myanmar, where there's recently a political coup, um, they've taken down the Internet. They've taken people off Facebook and Twitter. And you see parts of in India right now where there's a, where there's a protest about farmers. There's another problem taking down. I mean, how, how does how does Twitter how do Twitter and Facebook handle these international problems? Well, not well. I mean, I think that's the issue. They're so complex. In Myanmar, that's happened several times. There's a lot of incidents of Facebook doing a bad job monitoring its platform and then riots and deaths resulting. That was several years ago. In this case, they, the, the, the governments really want to control the flow of information. And most people get their news from Facebook. It's like a, it's some number in the 90s of how many people get their daily news from Facebook. It's pretty high in the United States. And so they definitely want to control the flow of information, the ability to organize and things like that. Um, in other cases, like in the Philippines, the government uses it to to put out false information about uh, its opponents. And so it can be used, you know, both in ways that are uh, good for dictators and bad for dictators. And so they want to control it. But, you know, but the, the social media can do things like promote uh, democracy. I mean, it gets cut out of certain places if a country like Myanmar doesn't want uh, doesn't want people gathering to, to protest, uh, for instance, a military coup. So it, it has had a value in terms of promoting democracy around the world. Yeah, so is the fax machine, right? That's what happened in China many, many years ago. They used a fax machine to reach people. It can be used, it's just like any anything. Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, says things like this are to, it, digital tools, are, the digital 
technologies are either a tool or a weapon. You can use them as a tool, create democracy. You can use it as a weapon, kill democracy. I think Greta, the problem is human beings. That's really the situation is that we tend to take these tools and we either use them often for good. And they, believe me, when I started covering the internet, I had that feeling like here's a way to unite the world in sort of this Star Trek vision. And for those who are big sci-fi fans, I think a lot of tech people are, I, I use this analogy because I think it's easy for them to understand. You're either a Star Trek or a Star Wars person. And in Star Trek, you have great hope for all the technology. You're going to go out and meet new people. And even when there are villains, you're going to change their mind through good, smart debate and bringing goodness and democracy and, and diversity to the universe. And then there's Star Wars, where even the heroes are flawed and the villains win a lot. And even when you win, you can lose and people die. And so it's a darker vision of, of the future, um, where even even when they win the sword fight, they don't. it's never over. And so that's really, I think, probably the real world. But I like to live in a Star Trek universe. For a growing part of VOA's audience, social media is the primary way or the only way to reach them. All 49 of VOA's language services use a combination of social media platforms. Facebook is the strongest of the social media platforms for VOA to reach audiences streaming live reports and programs there. In 2020, VOA's digital and social media efforts exceeded its goals reaching more than 10 million people each week. Soon after the January 6th attack at the U.S. Capitol, social media giants Twitter and Facebook suspended and then banned former President Donald Trump from their platforms. A short time later, Twitter made its ban of the former president permanent. Facebook is considering reversing their decision, but that call will be made by the company's independent oversight board. VOA's Tina Trin has more on this process. Now that former President Donald Trump was acquitted at his impeachment trial in the U.S. Senate, he faces another court of sorts, the Facebook Oversight Board. It will decide whether the internet company's decision to indefinitely block the former president from Facebook and Instagram was the right call. In, in a way, it's an experiment. Uh, and I think uh, many people believe that this is the way forward uh, because the alternative is, I think, for the government to be making the rules or Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg to make it, do you making those decisions. Andy Bayuni, an Indonesian journalist, is one of 20 members of the Oversight Board. We take into account, of course, Facebook's uh, standards, Facebook values, and international uh, human rights laws. Members recently issued their first rulings, and in four out of five cases overturned Facebook's decisions to remove content. Facebook complied with the board's decisions and reinstated the posts. Please welcome the 45th After Trump's appearance at a January 6 rally, Facebook referred its decision to ban Trump to the board for review and also asked for a review of how it should handle speeches by world leaders. Some are asking if the board itself makes sense. This is sort of like Walmart, you know, or Aston Martin or Jaguar or something, deciding to have a court, right? Which is really very strange. The social media giant is acting as if it were a sovereign nation with its own court structure, says law professor Lillian Edwards. The more people discuss what the board does, the less they discuss whether there should be a board at all. Others blame an absence of government regulation that tech companies can easily fill. It doesn't solve the structural problems of the business models, of the algorithmic amplification of hatred that I think have to be addressed. Board member by uni says the goal is not to replace government regulations. We don't see ourselves as a substitute to the laws uh, in, in the diff different countries. You know, that's for them to, to to decide. But we are here to help in content moderation. The board is accepting public comment on Facebook's Trump ban and expects to make a decision as soon as possible. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. As Facebook looks to revolutionize its approach to content moderation and policy decision-making, there is question how Facebook's policies might cause a ripple effect for other platforms. In part two of my discussion with Kara Swisher, we talked about what the future of social media will look like. 
initially they have taken Donald Trump off of Facebook right now. So what they did is they elevated the issue to a new thing. It's an independent group, allegedly independent. A lot of people question. I, I, I believe them that it is independent. It's funded by Facebook. Um, it's made over right now. I think it's 20 people. It's supposed to be 40 at some point. Um, uh, people from across the world, and they're going to take up this case of, of banning Donald Trump permanently or not off of Facebook. And they will decide this group of international, oh, it's a variety of people. Some, you know, one woman was the, was the prime minister of Denmark, for example, the former prime minister of Denmark, um, and all kinds of legal scholars and different people, different walks of life, different parts of the world. And they'll decide Donald Trump's fate because they elevated this one question. But there's no doubt he broke the rules of these platforms over and over and over again. The question is whether in, in the case of Twitter, he's off completely for the rest of his life. In the case of Facebook, we're, we have to wait and see what this oversight board decides. But it's sort of interesting. I mean, it can also, I had a situation where um, I was in a refugee camp in Bangladesh, a Rohingya refugee camp, and took a picture of some adults. And, and unbeknownst to me, because I wasn't paying attention, was a child probably under two who was naked, something you'd see in the, in the old days in National Geographic. You know, there was nothing particularly pornographic about it. Um, you couldn't even, you couldn't really see much of the child, but I never saw it. I put it up and it was taken down as objectionable. And then I protested it because I didn't want to be seen as putting a, you know, naked children uh, on the internet, I never saw it in the picture, and it, and it was it was it was not an objectionable picture. It's news. Yeah, Twitter's been. I mean, Twitter not not Twitter. I think this is Facebook, right? It has been struggling with this. They had issues around breast cancer is issues a long time ago. There, not that long ago, but about I forget how many years ago. Over the My Life pictures, uh, there's all kinds of pictures that you, there, a famous picture of the girl running from napalm. Do you remember that one where mm -hmm. she's naked, her clothes? And they took it down initially and then they put it back up. And so what pro what happens is a lot of this stuff is algorithmic and it naturally pulls it down, which it should to try to protect, um, you know, against pornography or child pornography or things like that. And then when they review it, they tend to put things back up uh, most of the time when it's legitimate news pictures. Um, but that their, their systems, especially around nudity, are very they spend a lot of time focused on on nipples, for example. And a lot of people think that that's not where they should be focusing on, that they should have a much more robust content moderation system. They've tried all kinds of ways to do it algorithmically with people. Um, uh, there's some very good reporting on what happens when they have content moderators. They tend to go crazy after doing a lot of this moderation because some of it's so vile and you know, whether it's abuse or, or or all kinds of things happen on the or conspiracy theories. How many, I mean, there must be billions of uh, posts that they look at every day on Twitter and on, on face, and on Facebook trying to determine whether or not it's inappropriate and it's sort of a squishy standard. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, that's the problem is they've got rules, but they don't enforce them all terrifically. You know, they, they sometimes enforce them. They sometimes don't. They make mistakes like anybody would. The volume of content coming over these platforms is so vast, I think it would be hard not to make mistakes. But I do think that they they haven't put enough guardrails in place at all in order to stop the mistakes in the first place or to deal with them. That's because it's really expensive to moderate all this stuff, right? And so they tend to want to not moderate it at all, like let it go and we'll pick up the mess afterwards, rather than create a system that's safer. A lot of people on the conservative part of the political spectrum got upset with Twitter, especially after President Trump was banned permanently from it, and went on to a, a, a social platform called Parler. What is Parler? What? Well, it's back up again. But what was it? It was a it was a it was a typical it was like a, a Facebook Twitter kind of amalgamation where people posted things. So it would look very familiar to anyone who uses Facebook or, or Twitter in some ways. And so people were posting all kinds of things. They many people felt a lot of the organization happened there, along with on Facebook, too, not just Parler. And uh, I actually did an interview with the CEO that got him in a bit of trouble where he said he didn't really take responsibility for anything on the platform. And well, then the people, the vendors he relies on do take responsibility. And so Apple and Google banned the app. And then Amazon said, we're not going to host your, your, your service anymore because you refuse to fix the moderation issues. And so somewhere down the, down the line, there's someone who just doesn't want to proceed with certain platforms. Um, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of, of other of conservatives complaining about conservative bias, there's no proof of it. And they keep saying it, and it doesn't mean it's so. It's like a lot of things that some people say in this country. I'm going to use the some people say thing, Greta. Um, but it's a lot like a lot of things. It's not true. There's been no evidence of this. They continue to say it. There's study after study not showing it, uh, but they believe it. So, uh, you know, I don't know what to say about that. There's a new app called Clubhouse that people are just beginning to join. What is it, and is that social media? 
it is in a way. It's a, it's sort it's sort of social media, but it's social media through audio. So what happened? And it's a little bit more like LinkedIn, a little bit. You could say it's a little like a business conference, or it could be a class at a university, could be a dinner party or a bar. Like it's kind of got a weird thing where you go in. There's all these rooms that get created, and some by the people on the service, some by just people just doing it. Um, and you become the host of a room and then discuss a certain topic, but the host gets to limit who gets to talk or not. And then there's discussions and it could be a lecture. It could be an interview. It could be a, a wide ranging discussion among everybody. And so it's an audio version of a social network. And it's it's not it's a social network in the in the truly underscore social, because that's what people are doing is socializing or being entertained by other people. And is it self moderated self because people can toss people out of the room? The host can. It doesn't the host mean can. if the host is offensive, I don't know what you do. I mean, you could make anything on these services. You could. They say they don't want hate speech, but how can you stop it, really? That's the same thing. Facebook says it doesn't want hate speech, but you know a lot of hate speech is on Facebook. And so it's the question is, can they moderate audio? That's like it's much harder to do. You know, YouTube faces a much harder challenge than a Facebook or a Twitter because it's easier to monitor algorithmically text than it is video. And so audio presents another quantum diff level of difficulty. So it could quickly degenerate into some bad things. It could also be some good things. And so we'll see if people continue to need to do this after the, the pandemic's over, but it's certainly tailor-made for a pandemic situation where people are stuck at home and want some socializing. All right, let me go back to the beginning where I started, where I asked you about how long you've been covering this thing. And, and I asked mm -hmm. you that because I think you've been covering it more deeply and more than anyone else I know. Um, has your opinion about the value of social media changed from, the, from when you first started covering it to now? I was wary about it from the beginning because I saw what happened on the Internet. You know what I mean? And then this was a quantum level of... of uh, of, of more ability to spy on people, to collect data. I always had an issue with that, that people were uploading all kinds of private information, all kinds of personal information to these services and getting very little in return, except for a chat or a date or a map. And so I've always been worried about the data collection around them and the kind of information people, and they live their lives online and what that these companies, are they fully protecting your privacy? The second thing is I don't think they care about the consequences of these tools. And, uh, you know, just like caring, you know, you can look at nuclear uh, nuclear energy in a good way or you could look at it like a bomb, right? There's just lots of different ways. And I think they don't take enough care uh, to deal with the, with the misinformation implications, with the ability of people to cheat and to lie and to steal on these platforms. Um, and and they don't do enough about it. And I'm not sure I'm not sure they can, given the, the amount of information, but they certainly don't seem to care for the consequences, to think about the consequences before they make things. And so I've always had an issue with that. All right, now looking at your crystal ball, um, 10 years from now, um, we're having a conversation about uh, social media. What do you think the conversation's gonna be? I think eventually you'll be plugged in all the time with something in your ear. So you'll always be, you, you'll be going somewhere, you're wearing a pair of glasses or there'll be some, element where you look at, say you're in Paris and you look at the Eiffel Tower, it'll tell you everything about the Eiffel Tower while you're sit, standing there without a book, without a phone, not staring down, you'll be looking up. And so I think probably that's the way it's going to go. And hopefully we'll be able to sort out some of these terrible problems that we've had and the lies, but it's it's a medium designed for lies and propaganda. And, and every medium can be abused that way. But this one really can reach a million different people with a million different lies, and it gives it great power to do great damage and also great good. Kara, thank you very much. Always nice to see you and talk to you. Thank All you. right. Thanks, Greta. Australia is taking a step towards regulating social media, requiring tech giants to pay publishers to have their content shared on their platforms. And after a five-day Facebook ban on news stories for Australian users, Facebook has reached an agreement with Australia. Now Facebook has agreed to pay news providers for news shared to Australia. Google has already struck deals with several news providers to include their content in its news feeds. In many other countries, government regulation of social media is under consideration. Gillian York is the Director for International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization that defends civil liberties in the digital world. We talked about the challenges of moderating speech on social media. What makes moderating speech so difficult is the sheer scale of it. Back when social media platforms uh, started out 10, 15 years ago, they were dealing with a much smaller number of people. And so it was easy to moderate speech 
um, using human moderators. As time has gone on, we've seen a lot more automation brought into the picture. And frankly, automation just doesn't do this as well as a human touch. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, human moderation um, requires quite a bit of attention and it's simply too costly for companies to get this right. Where's the line, if, if there is even a, a way to describe, between government censoring, and I take the example of the heavy-handed by India against Twitter, um, and social media uh, content moderation for questions of decency or what's appropriate, what might be inflammatory, inciting violence? I mean, where's the line? Uh, but the line is often really blurry. So, I mean, you know, on the one hand, you've got democratic governments that put laws in place, such as Holocaust denial being illegal in Germany, um, and companies are going to want to comply with that uh, to, to keep operating there. On the other hand, a lot of the rules that they put in place are really, you know, the ideologies or ideals of a given executive. So we've seen this week some reports that Mark Zuckerberg's uh, political beliefs have played into the way that he moderates speech on his platform. That's really, you know, some of the more problematic aspects of this, the fact that a lot of these decisions are really, you know, not up to a democratic process, um, but rather up to, you know, the whims of a handful of executives at a company. Well, these are big companies. They have a lot of money. So, I mean, it's not, there's not a shortage of money for these companies. That's true. Um, a lot of these companies would rather invest in, you know, acquisitions, um, invest in their engineering teams, their PR teams, um, whereas content moderators are often some of the lowest paid workers. Some of them are um, employed through third party firms in places like the Philippines and in the southwest of the U.S. Um, they're simply not given the care that they deserve. Do Twitter and, Ev and Facebook pretty much use the same methodology for moderating content or is it different? It's a little bit different. Facebook is a much bigger company with a lot more money, um, and they do have offices around the world where their content moderators work. They also employ a lot more automation um, from the very beginning, um, where you know the speech may not even pass through human eyes. Whereas Twitter keeps most of their moderation in-house, um, and there is much more of a human touch to it. They're also less likely to take things down entirely, um, particularly at government's requests, but rather use something called geolocational blocking uh, to make sure that people in a given country cannot see the content if the government doesn't want them to. Well, it must take some de degree of sophistication as to what might be inappropriate. For instance, um, Facebook, um, which uh, was criticized heavily for um, inciting violence against the Rohingya as a, as a forum, um, people used it. Um, so how, how do you moderate against something like that? What's, who determines the level of sophistication and what gets, what gets taken out and what doesn't? Yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult thing to get right, but a lot of these companies aren't really trying that hard. When it comes to Facebook, what we saw in Myanmar was really a lack of attention, a lack of local uh, expertise being brought in, and also a lack of um, individuals moderating content in the Burmese language. Back when the uh, Facebook was first getting reports that genocide was happening there, they only had something like um, eight or ten moderators who had expertise in the given language. What about the mixed standards for countries? For instance, in India recently, there was a fight between India and Twitter. India wanted, uh, the government demanded that uh, Twitter block a number of accounts. But here in the United States, because we have a First Amendment right, something like that might not have happened along the same lines. It's about a protest over the Indian farmers. So how do they reconcile the different standards in the different countries? Yeah, these companies are absolutely subject to local jurisdiction, especially when they have um, boots on the ground, so to speak, or individuals in a country. India is one of those countries. It's obviously, you know, a pretty profitable country for a lot of these platforms. And so they do have to comply with local law. Whereas in the United States, of course, it's very unlikely that law enforcement or uh, the executive branch of the government would even demand that speech be taken down, although it's not unheard of. Um, and so when it comes to India, it's really difficult for these companies to refuse an order because it means that they'll probably get blocked or kicked out of the country. A government, any government around the world, have the right or the force to shut down social media or to ban people or to control social media? I don't think that they should. Um, although I do think that there are, of course, some reasonable restrictions to be put in place. I think that denying people access to these platforms really does great harm. Um, you know, it is, of course, governments that use these platforms, but it's also the people. And we've seen over the past decade and a half uh, the ways in which these platforms can provide powerful space for community engagement, for protest um, and for organizing. What do you see as the future? I think that we have to put the power back in the hands of users um, in order to have a different future than the one that we're headed toward. Um, so what I would like to see is a much more democratic process being put into place where users and people around the world can have more of a say in the way that these platforms govern their spaces. 
Jillian, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. That's all the time we have for now. My thanks to Kara Swisher and Jillian York. Check voanews.com for the latest news updates. And yes, I'm on social media. Follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.